before I begin, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Alice for presiding over the session. I'd also obviously like to congratulate Christy on her award. Um, when, uh, when she asked me to speak in the session, I was uh, thinking about some of the work that I had read uh, from her group, and I thought, well, what can I talk about so that it sort of fits in maybe with some of her interests and her group's interests? And I'd read a couple of her papers actually from a few years ago uh, involving platelets, and we have uh, a platelet component uh, in our research group, so I thought, well, I'll talk a little bit about the platelet, and then I actually did something that probably most speakers don't do much. I actually went and read the abstracts of the other speakers in the session and uh, saw that with Chris and uh, Sue speaking in here uh, in the session, I, I said, I bet there'll be some sort of nitric oxide work going on, um, some immune response. And so actually, I'm glad I chose this for my uh, topic because the platelet has all those uh, components. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today is some of the work in our group uh, that we've been performing um, I'm actually going to show you some work that may actually be five, six years old now, uh, but tying in with some recent work in our group uh, from Kari Anderson, our group, where we're actually looking at cell signaling uh, in the platelet. And this project that uh, Kari uh, specifically has been working on for quite some time, it, it's been a little bit challenging. And, you know, the funny thing is, is that it actually gets back to one of the core components of any analysis, and that is proper sample handling. Uh, again, we find in our group that you know, and I often tell the classes that I teach at Michigan State that, you know, in my opinion, the measurement portion of any analysis is actually quite easy. It's, it's the sample prep and getting ready to make the measurement that's actually quite challenging. And you'll see some of that today. And so uh, to begin, uh, I will talk, uh, give a little bit of an um, overview here of what my talk's going to be about. I'll spend just a couple slides chatting a little bit about the platelet. Uh, it's actually a unique component in the bloodstream, which deserves a little bit of time. Um, we'll actually, I'll talk a little bit about previous efforts, primarily from our group, although again, uh, many groups study you know, platelet biology, but previous efforts from our group to study uh, the platelet. Uh, and then I'll also talk about then some of our obstacles that we had to get around uh, with some novel sample prep in order to actually study uh, a receptor uh, on the platelet that many platelet biologists believe is not as important as other receptors uh, on the platelet surface. And then I'll also end with a few slides um, showcasing some of our current efforts to actually take some of these measurement schemes to a true high throughput uh, system. And so this story actually starts about seven or eight years ago uh, when I was at Wayne State University. Uh, I had a postdoc in the group, uh, Dr. Paul Root, and Paul had been uh, actually working in a biochemical and molecular biology lab at the University of Windsor, and he had been doing some work with platelets. And when he came to my group, he noticed that, you know, on a maybe once or twice a week uh, time scale, we were actually exsanguinating rabbits, meaning that we were getting about 70 to 80 milliliters of whole blood from these rabbits, primarily interested in separating out and using the red blood cells. But of course, after that centrifugation of the whole blood, you actually have the entire top layer there of plasma, which contains these platelets. And Paul said, have you ever thought about doing any work with the platelets? And I said, no, I don't even know how to purify them. And so uh, he showed our group how to do that. And since then, it's become uh, pretty much a, a, you know, its own branch or wing in our research group. So I'm always indebted to Paul for getting us started on some of our platelet efforts. Uh, th just a little bit about the platelet. Again, these are some activated and aggregated platelets right here. Uh, but again, the platelet is about two micrometers in diameter. There's about 150 million platelets per milliliter of whole blood. Like the red cell, they're non-nucleated, which continues with our group's trends of liking to work with cells that don't have nuclei. Uh, they, however, the platelet, unlike the red cell, does contain mitochondria. Uh, it's involved in the blood clotting process. Again, I think uh, for most of us, that's probably its best known role. Uh, it does circulate along the wall of the blood vessel. Uh, due to the, the fahrenheit lindquist effect, the red cells primarily stay towards the center of the vessel. The platelets will then be more closer to the wall of the vessel, which makes sense because if you have some sort of vessel wall injury, they're there to go up and clot the wall and, and stop any uh, further damage. Average circulation lifespan of the platelet, about eight days relative to a red cell. If it's a healthy red cell, about 110 to 120 days. Of course, you know, tying in with what Christy was mentioning earlier, sickle cell, like an average sickle cell red cell, I think only goes through the circulation for maybe a couple weeks or something like that. So there are differences, of course, depending on your health state. Uh, some of the observations just in the literature uh, that our group has noticed uh, about the platelet is that hyperactive platelets are, have actually been associated with many disease states. I just list four here. Uh, people with diabetes, cystic fibrosis, 
uh, certain forms of hypertension, uh, and of course sickle cell, are all known to have platelets that are hyperactive, meaning that their platelets seem to be uh, activated, they aggregate more, they stick to the vessel wall when they're not supposed to. Okay, of course, if you have some sort of vessel damage, we want those platelets aggregating and sticking to the vessel wall. However, patients uh, in these uh, groups right here often have platelets that do that even when there's not really any serious vessel wall damage. And of course, uh, this is a, a very large area of research in trying to figure out why do the platelets of these people actually stick when they're not supposed to. And of course, it's a huge pharma industry in coming up with uh, drugs that will prevent that, uh, such as uh, Plavix, which if I remember is it might still be like the third best-selling uh, drug in the world. Plavix's job is to prevent platelet adhesion uh, in the vasculature. However, these observations here uh, that are known with these patient groups have also been related to other features that our group uh, has a very keen interest in. For example, all of these patient groups that I've shown here that are known to have hyperactive platelets, these groups also have been reportedly uh, these groups also have low nitric oxide bioavailability, okay? And so that's a general term to say that in some of the tissues in these people's uh, vasculature, um, the nitric oxide levels are actually lower than what they should be, lower than that of a healthy control. This becomes important when one considers that nitric oxide actually reduces uh, platelet activation and adhesion, and I think Chris had mentioned that in his talk. And platelets themselves are actually very good nitric oxide producers, okay? Uh, the other interesting feature about this, and again, this is something that our group has studied now for nearly a decade, is that all of these patient groups that I'm showing here on the left, they also have red blood cells who release less ATP upon certain stimuli than healthy controls. Now again, the reason that I'm telling you this, and bringing in the red cell story here, is that this ATP that's released from the red cell and, uh, you know, again, might be found in the vasculature, is also a known stimulus of nitric oxide in platelets and definitely in endothelial cells. So when you kind of put this all together, one of the things that I've often wondered is, you know, do these patient groups here who are known to have red blood cells that release less ATP, is that reduction in ATP resulting in an insufficient nitric oxide bioavailability, which has actually been coined uh, or lately in the transfusion medicine world, they're actually calling this ANOVA because it's such a, main, a major problem. You know, does this reduced ATP level actually result in that lower NO level? And so if we were to actually take a look at this sort of pictorially, this is a, a slide that my group uses quite often. One of the things that we actually believe about the platelet is, if we were taking a look here at sort of a cross section of a, uh, a blood vessel, where here we have the endothelial cells lining the vessel wall, a subendothelium, uh, and then we have out here, for example, smooth muscle cells. And of course, this is a reduced picture of uh, you know, a vessel wall. But um, if we have our red blood cells flowing through that uh, blood vessel, if they're subjected to some sort of stress, maybe hypoxia, some sort of stimulus, such as iloprost, which is a stable form of one of the prostaglandins, they'll actually stimulate an ATP release. When that ATP re is released from the red blood cell, it has many fates, a couple of which, though, is that it can actually bind to perinergic receptors on the endothelium and stimulate ENOS, which will produce nitric oxide in the endothelium, if that nitric oxide is then, or if it's able to diffuse to the smooth muscle layer, that's where you'll actually see the smooth muscle cells relax, and you'll see that dilation that Chris mentioned in his talk. However, another aspect of this ATP, or another fate that our group uh, has long had an interest, is does that ATP bind to perinergic receptors on the platelet and stimulate nitric oxide production in the platelet, which again, the platelets are known to do. In that construct, one could then actually see that if the red blood cell can stimulate nitric oxide in the platelet, and nitric oxide is known to reduce adhesion and activation in the bloodstream, one can then actually sort of envision that the red blood cell is actually a mediator, in a way, of the platelet's uh, activation and adhesion along the endothelium in vivo. And so this is one of the working hypotheses that our group has had in our group now since maybe about 2004, 2005, when Paul introduced platelets to our group. And so just to get a feel for this, uh, one of the things that our group did uh, actually about five, six years ago now is we actually did try to measure nitric oxide uh, both, intra, well, both in the platelet and its release from the platelet. And here you can just see is just some typical spectra using that DAF-FM uh, fluorogenic probe uh, for nitric oxide. 
And what we're showing here is, for example, just basal levels of NO in the platelet here in the black trace. If we add some ATP, you can see a slight increase in the nitric oxide production. And these, these platelets here were actually still in plasma. But if we add L-name, uh, a competitive inhibitor with L-arginine uh, for ENOS, so it's basically a nitric oxide production inhibitor, you can see that when we add L-name, we actually see a decrease here then in the fluorescence. And again, these experiments aren't anything that exciting, uh, but it does show that we can use these uh, fluorescence-based probes to measure the amount of nitri nitric oxide in the platelets, and in this case, the release from. And in fact, one other thing that I, I'm glad I put in here uh, is this is actually uh, our calibration curve that we use to quantitate the amount of nitric oxide released from the platelets. However, one of the things that we do in reading somebody's paper, I think that was in Feb's letters or something a few years ago, we actually use the method of standard additions here. We actually spike our donors into our platelets and then, you know, with the probe. So in that way, if there is any sort of interferences or uh, problems that we might have using this probe, hopefully they'll come out when we actually do this method of standard, method of multiple standard additions here. To quantitate then the amount of nitric oxide that might be released from the platelet, and here you can see the amount of NO uh, in the, that's released from the platelet. If we add ATP, a known stimulus of that NO, ADP, which will also stimulate NO production in the platelet, and of course, when we have the inhibitor in there. So from these studies, we can see that NO can actually easily be measured in platelets with luminescence, uh, spectrophotometry, fluorescence here. We saw about 10 to 20 atomoles released per platelet. This wasn't our intracellular values. But we also found a way that we could easily add agonist inhibitors to these platelets and start studying how much nitric oxide was actually produced. However, the only problem with these studies, well, it wasn't really a problem, but I wanted to keep growing this particular uh, aspect of our research in our group, is that this is just measuring a molecule in the platelets. I actually wanted to get to the point where I could watch platelets, you know, aggregating, which of course I could do with a platelet aggregometer, which if you've never used one of those, it's a nice little spec 20 that has a really good stir bar in it. That's all a platelet aggregometer is. However, I also wanted to look at the adhesion of these platelets, but I just didn't want to see them adhering to, you know, collagen or fiber nectar or something like that. I wanted to see them adhering to an endothelium, such would be the case uh, in vivo. And so, again, you know, about, uh, I think maybe, well, I think maybe it's been about eight or nine years ago, we actually went over to Sue's lab uh, at Kansas when I was still or at, um, yeah, we went to Sue Lunty's lab when I was a professor at St. Louis University, and we actually made some of our initial chips, but I thought that microfluidics would actually be a good way to go to actually study some of the platelet adhesion, and so again, for the past six, seven years, our group has been making microfluidic devices to actually examine uh, platelet adhesion to an endothelium, and again, we use the standard soft lithography of spin coat, bake, put over a mask, you know, put a UV source on it and develop. You get your master, which of course, then you can pour a PDMS on and get some sort of features uh, that you can uh, reproducibly use. Uh, again, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, some of our current efforts with these microfluidic devices, because as I'll show you in, a, in about five, 10 minutes, there's some problems with using PDMS uh, for some of our studies. But anyways, when we do uh, use these devices, uh, we're able to do things like, you know, immobilize endothelial cells in a channel. This channel here, I think, is actually about 100 micrometers wide. It was about 100 micrometers deep. So these are endothelial cells from bovine, bovine pulmonary artery. When we flow platelets across these endothelial cells, we can actually see, although you can't see it very well with this image, I've tried to circle some of them here because it's a bright field. Uh, we can actually see platelets sticking to these endothelial cells. And the neat thing is, even though this particular channel here was coated with fibronectin, we only see the platelets sticking to the endothelial cells. They don't actually stick that well to the fibronectin. Uh, but then if we actually use the fluorescently uh, tag platelets, the, the, the bright dots here, then in the, you know, in the fluorescence mode, you can actually see platelets sticking to the endothelial cells. So these are under conditions of flow. Then we flow out with a buffer that doesn't contain any platelets, and you can actually see uh, the platelets sticking to the endothelium. And again, this work is now about five, six years old. In fact, uh, at this conference, I think six years ago, uh, Celia uh, Arnaud did a really nice story on some of our work showing the platelets sticking to the endothelial cells. And in fact, she followed that up with another really nice general um, story on using microfluidic devices to mimic biological systems. And in this particular uh, issue here of CNE News, she highlighted some really nice work from uh, Rustamus Magaloff's group uh, while he was at Chicago, uh, Shu Takayama's group, Scott Martin at St. Louis U, my group, and a couple others. Dave Beebe's group, I think, had some nice work in here. So again, if you want a nice overview of using microfluidic devices to study 
or mimic biological systems, that's a good place to start right there. So again, this work though is now you know, like five, six years old in some cases. Uh, but the nice thing about using the microfluidic devices though uh, to study these platelet interactions with the endothelial cells is we can, fl and by the way, so I got this set on high contrast here so it stood out a little bit more. Uh, but here you can actually see the platelets, uh, the bright dots sticking to endothelial cells, which you can't see because I had the contrast on so high. But we can actually do things, we can manipulate both cell types. So this is actually looking at multiple cell types and single devices, which now is a, a big push. It's a big consortium effort between the NIH and DARPA to, you know, have these systems that contain multiple cell types. Uh, you know, again, we've been doing this for a few years now. But we can actually do things like add L name to the endothelial cells, so we can actually the, inhibit the nitric oxide production of the endothelium, then flow these platelets over the endothelial cells. And remember how I said that nitric oxide is actually an inhibitor uh, of platelet activity or inhibits platelet adhesion. Well, if you turn off the nitric oxide production in those endothelial cells, you actually can see then an increase in the number of platelets sticking to those endothelial cells. You can also do things like add agonists to the platelets, something like ADP, which will make them activate and start aggregating and adhere. And in this particular case, you see even a more increase in the amount of platelets adhering to the endothelial cells. Uh, taking it one step further, the data that I'm showing right here is actually a three cell system being investigated in a single channel. So this is actually endothelial cells coded in our microfluidic device. But then instead of just running platelets over that endothelium, we actually ran platelets that were in the presence of red blood cells. And we've done this with whole blood as well. And it's really interesting, you know, our theory that I had up on the slide a couple slides back, suggesting that it might actually be components of the red blood cell and its behavior that might be affecting how many platelets are sticking to the endothelium. But one of the things that we showed here with this particular set of data, which was uh, an analcom back in 08, is that if we actually counted the number of platelets, I think this was like per 0.08 square millimeters in our chip, uh, when we actually count the number of platelets adhering to the endothelium, you can see like maybe 15 or 16. However, if we have those same platelets now flowing with red blood cells, the number of platelets adhering to the endothelium actually decreases. Thinking that this might be due to an ATP release from the red cells, stimulating more nitric oxide in the system that's reducing the number of platelets adhering, we actually did the same study but now added glybanclamide to the red blood cells, which is an ATP release inhibitor. And you can see now, even with the red cells, if we inhibit the ATP release, the number of platelets then uh, sticking to the endothelium actually begins to increase. And again, we believe this is due to nitric oxide production now being turned off because we've turned off the ATP release stimulus in that system. Likewise, going the other way, if we add a known stimulus of ATP release from the red blood cell, such as um, C-peptide uh, mixed with zinc, C-peptide's the peptide that's co-secreted with insulin uh, from our pancreatic beta cells, and our group has found that it actually increases ATP release from healthy and diabetic cells, now, if we have an increase in ATP release, you can see we actually reduce the platelets even further from when it's just the red blood cells by themselves. So again, a really nice system here then to be able to study cell-to-cell -cell communication amongst multiple cell types and single devices, okay? The problem is, though, that we still are trying to figure out, is this effect on the platelet, meaning the ability to reduce the overall adhesion to the endothelium? Is the effect from the red blood cell because that ATP is stimulating nitric oxide in the platelet? Or is it stimulating nitric oxide in the endothelium? Or is it both, okay? And so, one of the things that our group would like to determine, and it's a little bit challenging, is what is the role of ATP on the platelet? The role of ATP in the endothelium is pretty well described in the literature. However, studying platelet P2X receptors, which is the ATP receptor on the platelet, is difficult because once you remove the platelets from the body, and especially after you remove those platelets from the plasma, the platelets do not like that. They begin to aggregate, they begin to activate, they start dumping out lots of ATP, ADP. It, it really messes up with their overall metabolic state. And what that leads to then is a rapid desensitization of that P2X receptor, okay? And it's because these platelets, when they start to activate and aggregate, they dump out tons of ATP, desensitizing then that particular receptor. And P2X, by the way, just the, for future uh, studies I'm going to show you here, P2X is an ATP-gated calcium channel. So most people don't believe, most platelet biologists don't believe that the P2X receptor actually plays a major role in platelet adhesion. And again, I think that what's happening is when the, the platelet begins to activate, all of this ATP, depicted by the triangles here, actually is dumped out of the platelet, desensitizing that receptor. So to get around that, 
what a lot of platelet biologists will actually do is they do most of their studies with large amounts of apyrase, uh, enzymes whose job is to break down ATP to ADP and possibly even ADP to AMP, et cetera. The reason for that is, is that if they can add that apyrase to the system, they can dephosphorylate the ATP to ADP and then clean the system of any ATP and clean that receptor as shown here. Then to perform their studies, what they'll actually use is alpha-beta-methylene ATP, which is a stable analog of ATP, which even the most powerful apyrases cannot uh, break down the uh, ATP to ADP. And so what they'll do is they'll add all of this alpha-beta-methylene ATP to the system, but there's just one problem in my mind. This alpha-beta-methylene ATP is not ATP. It's a stable form, and all along I've always thought, what if this P2X receptor here, for example, is a phosphatase? If that receptor can't break down the ATP to ADP when it's in this alpha-beta-methylene form, what would happen then is that alpha-beta-methylene ATP would bind to the receptor, and you'd see maybe a little bit of a calcium transient going into the platelet, but it's stuck. It can't get rid of the ATP to get its next molecule to allow more calcium in. So while you will have ATP around, it, it's a different form of ATP. And so this is what our group wanted to get around basically is, can we study these platelets without having to use a pyrase? And so we had been doing some studies with a P2X inhibitor called NF449, shown here on the right. And one of the things that uh, Kari and I had noticed in some of the articles involving uh, NF449 is there was a study using single frog oocytes where they reported picomolar level inhibition of P2X, and so we got that paper, we were reading it. However, interestingly, buried in the discussion, and this is why you read more than just abstracts sometimes, they also reported that they saw a deceleration of the desensitization of P2X when they were using this inhibitor. And I found that to be a very interesting, vague uh, statement there. However, we had seen this with other molecules uh, in our group. For example, hydroxyurea, going back to sickle cell. Our group has uh, reported a couple papers using hydroxyurea, which is the only essentially beneficial drug used for sickle cell patients. Hydroxyurea, if you use a certain concentration, is very beneficial. If you keep going with the hydroxyurea, it will have the exact opposite effect on cells. It's very concentration dependent. And I started to think maybe this P2X inhibitor is doing the same thing. And so one of the things that we uh, did then is we actually collected our whole blood, okay? We centrifuged and collected the plasma, purified the platelets into buffer. We would centrifuge that down and load our probe. In this case, is the Flow 4 AM uh, probe for calcium. We'd wash these cells a few times, and then Kari would actually resuspend in a calcium free buffer. We would then add 40 microliters of those platelets to a calcium containing buffer and collect the fluorescent emission after we added an agonist and continued the measurement. So this is what some of our typical data would look like here. And let me just walk you through this real quickly. So the sort of like olive colored trace here, which you can barely see, this is the fluorescence emission for now, remember, calcium going into our platelets. And you can see that when it's just the platelets plus the, you know, in the, in the calcium buffer, we don't see much of a calcium influx. There's no agonist here. When we add ATP, shown in the black trace. Again, this is typically what we would always see, and this is what other platelet biologists continually report, is that when they add ATP, they don't see any signal. Well, I think the reason that they don't see any signal is because they don't wash out the apyrase from their system. So the minute they add their ATP agonist, if you do the calculation, that ATP is gonna be chewed up within a second or two, based on the units that they use of the apyrase. Remember, this is an apyrase-free system. What Kari also did, though, is took some of those platelets that had a concentration of NF449 in there in the single digit micromolar levels. She would add that NF449, then when we add the ATP, we see a nice calcium signal, and this is incredibly reproducible. We can study it time and time again. And so the first few times we tried this, again, trying to learn a little bit more about how the NF449 is actually enabling us to do these uh, ATP measurements, and again, that's still a little bit up in the air. However, we are now getting a handle on this. One of the first things a reviewer said of this uh, manuscript right here, which recently appeared in Sue's journal there at the RSC, is, oh, your ATP must be breaking down to ADP, and you're actually seeing an ADP calcium signal. Well, to get around that, we did the same study here. These platelets, by the way, contain NF449. Uh, Kari added the ATP in the red trace here. Did the same thing in a calcium-free buffer with the ATP, shown in the black trace. So when there's no calcium around, 
there's no, there's no uh, signal from the ATP, which makes sense because, again, remember when the ATP binds to the receptor, that's when calcium goes in. So when there's no calcium in the extracellular matrix, we don't see a signal. Proving that we can still measure an ADP signal, we did that, and that's shown in the blue. ADP actually um, stimulates calcium release from the vesicles inside the platelet, okay? And so, again, pretty good controls here showing that we're actually seeing an ATP-stimulated influx of the calcium. Uh, it is uh, ATP concentration dependent here, showing uh, 730 nanomolar up to 5 micromolar ATP. By the way, if we actually change the concentration of the NF449, maybe like reduce it to say 500 nanomolar, then we will start to see signals from the 730 nanomolar value. So again, it's, it's, it, it almost appears that it's purely a competition between the ATP and the NF449, but we're still trying to prove that. And then finally, uh, remember I was mentioning to you about the alpha beta methylene ATP and that I don't like people using that because I, you know, if this receptor is some form of a pyrase or an ectopyrase, it's not going to do anything. It's going to get clogged. So here's these same studies, 500 nanomolar NF449. We add our ATP, get a nice uh, calcium transient there shown in red. However, if we used the alpha beta methylene ATP in the same concentration, you can see we start to get a signal and it's almost like things just get clogged up and it stops. And so this is incredibly reproducible with this alpha beta methylene ATP. So again, it does elicit a small response. This is the response that all other platelet biologists see. And of course, what they've come to the conclusion is, is that the ATP receptor on the platelet is not that important. Uh, however, I think the problem is, is that they're not using the form of ATP found in vivo. So um, this is what we know so far. Uh, we know how to study the effects of ATP on the platelet. We also understand the ratios, which I didn't completely show here today. It's in this manuscript down here from Kari. We understand the ratios of this inhibitor and the ATP that provide measurable signals. However, all's not completely good. What we don't know, we have no idea right now what the mechanism is of this NF449 stimulating this P2X receptor. We have some ideas, and we're working on that in the lab. We also don't know, is the red cell-derived ATP affecting the platelet or the endothelium or both? We still haven't gotten to that point. However, now we have a sample prep method that we can study this ATP receptor on the platelet and get back to this right here. So in my last few minutes then, I just want to go through really quickly and show you here some of our next steps. So again, combining some analytical chemistry with trying to be a, maybe a good amateur hematologist. These are some of the studies I think we need to perform to actually answer that question. Is it the platelet? Is it the endothelium? Is it the red cell? And I won't read all these to you. However, you can see, especially your graduate students, postdocs, lab techs, this is a lot of work that needs to be done. And so one of the things that we want to go to then is, you know, overcoming some of these challenges that are also associated with these steps. For example, sample size. You know, these are going to be a lot of studies to perform. That's going to be a lot of blood draws, especially if we start using CF mice, cystic fibrosis mice, which if you're lucky, you get a milliliter of blood. Uh, you can typically get 30 or 40 mils out of me in the morning without too much trouble uh, and other students in our lab. Uh, also, timing is an issue. These platelets are difficult to keep viable. Uh, for long periods of time. So you can't just draw some blood, get the platelets, and then you know, study them for the next 24 hours. They generally have to be studied rather quickly or they'll start activating and aggregating. Also, we have to keep in mind that we need the component of the flow because that's how platelets behave in vivo. And so, again, it looks like we're going to go back to the microfluidic devices, but I want to show you one problem. This, this is you know, basically the system that we've used in the past, a PDMS layer down here with our channels, these little L-shaped channels shaking, these L-shaped channels right here, all right, and this white little strip here is a polycarbonate membrane which we lay over our channels, it's porous. We've used this system before because if we can lay another piece of PDMS over that membrane that has wells in it, we can then actually culture endothelial cells in those wells on top of the membrane, flow our blood underneath, and when it releases the ATP, it goes through the pores, and we can study cell-to-cell -cell communication with this system. However, we have one problem that we're starting to find with PDMS, and again, I'm going to talk more about this in uh, one of the talks later this week, and Steve Halpin will also talk about this in his talk. However, I just want to show you here, we've actually tried to measure uh, clopidogrel uh, and its effects on these platelets in our devices, and it works, but there's one problem. Um, this is just the, the dark bars here is where Steve took some clopidogrel, just put it in sort of a plastic tube, let it set for an hour, took it out and took it over to the mass spectrometer and measured the clopidogrel. And, you know, you can see here that when he adds a certain amount, he measures a certain amount. When he does the same thing, putting this into PDMS, he adds a certain amount, and you can see we do not get it back on the y-axis. And basically what this is showing here, and we found this now with other hydrophobic molecules, they completely absorb into the PDMS, and we won't be able to use PDMS to study these effects. So just real quickly here, uh, I think I can just show you 
one of the things that we're moving towards then is using polystyrene-based devices. Again, last year I saw Nancy Albritton, and uh, I also saw some work from Dave Beebe's group working on polystyrene-based devices. We basically have in our group now developed, and I'll talk about this, I think, uh, in one of Scott Martin's section, uh, sessions later this week. We have a way of actually making polystyrene devices as simply as you can make a PDMF device. Uh, it's a very simple technique. We have it worked out. We can culture endothelial cells in serpentine channels. And the neat thing about all of this, the reason I have these serpentine channels lined up where they are, and you can see them here on this device, is that they actually line up perfectly with the microplate reader. So we'll be able to do all these studies and all these uh, agonist and inhibition studies that I just showed you on a previous slide with a plate reader using automatic pipettes, shown here with blood going through and the blood going through these serpentine channels, using eight channel automatic fluid delivery systems as the pumps. So it's going to be completely all self-contained, true high throughput using the microplate reader. And so to conclude real quickly, again, I do think if we start switching up and using some other um, substrates and systems, we can use the microfluidic devices uh, to help us understand our platelet biology. Sample handling is always key, as it is with any quantitative analysis. And again, I think if we advance our device substrate, sample delivery, get away from the pumps and start using fluid dispensing systems, and true automated detection with the plate reader, I think we can get those studies done in a relatively quick manner. And so I want to thank the group right here and Mert for throwing a little bit of funding in the lab, and I'll uh, try to take any questions. Thank you. We have time for maybe one or two questions. Oh, there's one in the back. Chris? One reason is, is if we can get the polystyrene to work, well, first of all, when we were at this conference last year, we went back to the labs. I thought Nancy's talk was pretty neat. One of my students came into the, my office like two weeks later and he said, hey, look at this. And he had this ugly yellow caramel burnt looking piece of plastic in his hand. And I go, what is that? And he goes, that's a polystyrene chip. So we had just started with it and we got it to work within a month. Now they're perfectly clear, no bubbles, et cetera. So that's one reason we can do it right now. The other reason is, is that if we truly can get this polystyrene to work, you know, everyone talks about rapid prototyping of PDMS and things like that. I don't know about anybody that actually rapidly prototypes PDMS. With these polystyrene-based devices and other plastics like that, I mean, we can contract out a company to make 500 of those for us and for nothing and have it in the lab ready to roll. So that's the other reason, too. And we can also use the polystyrene with automated microplate handlers. Because we make these things, I didn't show them here, but we make them the exact same dimensions as a 96-12 plate. So it's true integration. Yeah, here in front. Okay, so the question is, uh, interest in the forces that are required for the platelet and endothelial cell adhesion. Um, so, you know, that's another surprising thing. A, a lot of times, of course, you have to have some sort of damage to get the platelets to actually stick to the endothelial cells. We found in our system that even if we take healthy platelets, healthy endothelial cells, if we add just agonists, uh, such as the ADP, you actually get integrin activation uh, on the platelet surface, which then binds to the receptors on the endothelial cells. So at this point, it's mostly pharmacological uh, that we're inducing the platelet adhesion. But the diseased cells, the older cells, they, they adhere more on their own. So. Okay, thank you.